Yeah, we're cutting, hooking, and even Dilshan scooping our way into this Monday edition of the Sportsmax Zone. And we're continuing with cricket. West Indies will be looking to end their three-match T20 series against Australia early Tuesday morning Caribbean time with a win to avoid being whitewashed. The Windies are down 2-0 following their 34-run loss in Sunday's second T20 in Adelaide, Glenn Maxwell blasted an unbeaten 120 from 55 deliveries to lift the hosts to a mammoth four for 241 of their 20 overs before Marcus Stoinis with three for 36 and two wickets each for Josh Hazelwood and Spencer Johnson took Australia to the win despite a well-played 36 ball 63 from the captain Rothman Powell. A 2-1 series is better than a tree love. You know, and it, it, the guys are still confident, the guys are still upbeat that we can beat this Australia team. But it's going to take a greater effort from each and every one of us. That's what I tell myself in a tennis match all the time. 2-1 is better than 3-love when you're down. Yeah, well said, Rothman Powell. Let's get the thoughts of Nikhil Utamchandani as he joins us via Zoom. Nikhil, how are you doing on this fine Monday afternoon? Yeah, great, Ricardo. I'm enjoying your um, comedy, man. I tell you, you're a man of many talents. The Dill School, uh, the tennis matches. Yeah, keep it up, man. I'm enjoying <laughs> entertainment. Well, let's talk about the West Indies. I'm not sure how much you enjoyed the performance on Sunday. I certainly did, to be quite honest. It was another really good cricket match. West Indies um, finishing on the losing end. But assess this performance, especially in comparison to what we saw in the first T20, and specifically as well, the first T20, the bowlers got the second half of the Australia innings right. In the second T20, they got the first half right, but not the second. Yeah, Ricardo, I think um, talking improvements, there were some from that first T20. We spoke at length about the back-to-back -back overs in the power play. Robin Powell went away from that, so he obviously learned and made the adjustment. And you look at the two power plays in that first game, they conceded 77 runs. In the second one, 58, but they crucially took two wickets. They bowled really well to Warner, uh, frustrated him, uh, obviously controlled him, I would say, in the pub, which is an extremely hard thing to do. And then batting-wise, I would say in both games, it's been a real positive that someone has been able to take the game deep, but not only take the game deep, but be aggressive as well. First game, Brandon King. Second game, Captain Robman Powell. Uh, with that 63. I think what that knock showed me, and even Glenn Matzo's knock, because he was 10 from 10, and then obviously scored 100 from his next 40, 90 from his next 40 deliveries. It showed that even though you're chasing 240 or you're trying to get to 240, you actually have more time than you think. So you can actually spend 5 to 10 deliveries just to get in, and then you really launch on what are some unbelievably good surfaces for batting. So I think, look, there's a lot of positives to take from these two games. There are some areas which need big improvement, but I'm sure we'll address that um, during this segment. Yeah, before we get to some of those areas that need big improvement, I want to talk about the point that you just mentioned, just in terms of having more time, even though you are chasing a massive total. And I'm extremely happy that you brought up the, the, the case of Rothman Powell, because when Rothman Powell came to the wicket, you could see a deliberate attempt to get himself in, to work the ball around and pick up singles, um, to play with as little risk as possible. However, that was not the case with the top five or six where Brandon King, Johnson Charles, Nicholas um, Puran, Shea Hope, unfortunately, just came out blazing. And instead of, well, I, I would think maybe 100 for two, after 10 overs, you are 100 for five, and that changes the course of the game. Did the top order get it wrong, is the question I'm asking. No, I wouldn't say that, Ricardo, because 240 is an extremely menacing um, total, which obviously the West Indies will know firsthand what is required to chase somebody like that. Think back to South Africa last year when um, they posted that 258, and then Quinton de Kock gunned it down. So. Um, you really have to go firing from ball one. However, I think, like we spoke about in the first T20 International moments, so I don't fault them for being aggressive, 
But I do think they can sort of just pick their moments a bit better. Guys like Shea Hope as, and, and Puran, for those two especially, I think the quality is so immense when they're at the crease against all bowling types and the ability against spin as well. I think that's what the West Indies have missed. Just how well they can attack Adam Zampa, not having them stay at the crease for a while, which is pr pretty much the reason that they're playing in that 11, mainly for that reason to attack the spin. I think that has kind of hurt the West Indies because then you're exposing Robin Powell, uh, Russell, Shepard, guys that I would say leg spin is probably... They're not their strength. Um, so I think for that reason, maybe those two guys especially. But I think when you're chasing 240, it is extremely hard to, to sort of take it easy for the first 10 deliveries. And when Powell came to the crease, th the game was almost pretty much gone. So I thought he was trying to save some face and then realized, hold on a minute, uh, at 50, he realized we could actually get this. So there'll be learnings. But again, 240 uh, is, is extremely monstrous. So yeah, they have to go. Uh, let me see if I can explain myself in a different way by utilizing some examples. So, one of the things I was disappointed with, the first three or four overs, I think, only one batsman faced those deliveries. So, for example, you had Brandon King swinging, 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 missing, 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 missing. And at no point did he try to just get off strike and say to Johnson Charles, maybe you will do a better job at this. Then there were a couple of other overs where they got a six and a four um, at the start of the over, saw that with Nicholas Perrin, and then four dot balls. So it was more about understanding, one, rotating the strike is important, especially when you've gotten off to a, a good start, um, but also not getting yourself into a situation where one bowler is consistently able to bowl six deliveries at one batsman, especially um, you would think after they had worked them out. And I think I saw that just a little bit too often in those first six overs, and it's an area, I think, that can be improved. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I, I thought you were mainly addressing the intent. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, and Ian Bishop always speaks about it, how can you maximize more delivery? So not necessarily a dot ball percentage or dots, but just how can you score off of as many deliveries as possible? And you look at the best teams in the world, Australia, uh, Pakistan are very good at it, India, of course. They are able to score off of so many deliveries so that even when they're not getting the boundaries, um, they're able still to get, you know, you hit one boundary, but you still get 10 or 12 off the over, which in, in the grand context of the game becomes significant. So... I think when they look back on that chase, they'll say if we were smart in a few moments. And even that Brandon King example, in the first T20 international, he was going. Rhythm, everything was perfect. Second one, not so much. So can he have that sort of awareness to say, well, Jono at the other end is going really well. Let me just get off strike. Similar to what Stoinis and Matsuo did. Many people will look at that partnership and say, well, 16 from 15 from Stoinis, not great. However, you look at Matsu at the other end and the partnership as a whole, it was excellent just for that situation and the awareness of the game situation as well. Yeah, um, Nikhil, outside of Azari Joseph, who has two test 50s and five first-class 50s, every batsman on the West Indies' current T20 team, well, that played so far, have scored hundreds in high-level cricket, if only list A cricket. Um, how much do you consider this a benefit to this West Indies team? Because at, at the face of it, they, they really have batting down to 11. No, it's a massive benefit, um, Lance. I think it's a benefit that puts them right up there as a favourite for the World Cup. However, I think the bowling must be rectified, must be improved upon if they're to have any chance. But on the batting, I think it's so strong. You have someone like Jason Holder, who in the two games has scored 62 runs from 31 balls, batting at nine. That's a strike rate of 200. If you have him coming in at nine, Akil Hossein, we've seen play a few cameos at the international level, and Joseph, as you mentioned. If you've got that much depth, I think you can sacrifice one of those batters or even one of those all-rounders, but probably batters, because you're trying to get an extra bowling option in. So I think in West Indian conditions, when that World Cup comes around, I could easily see Gurukesh Morty, Akil Hossein starting together. It may have to come at the expense of a Sherpain Rutherford, just because I think it is very important to have some variety with a six bowling option, and they have enough depth to do it. Jason Holder has batted at three for the West Indies. Um, I think back to 2021 in that Sri Lanka series. So he's more than capable at number nine, and we said that already. So I definitely think 
that depth is a big plus, but I think we may, we could be using it a bit better and need to get an extra bowling option. Yeah, we've discussed on the show before, Nikhil, that winning these matches against the Aussies isn't the ultimate for the, for the coaching staff as we prepare for the T20 World Cup, and that's perfectly understandable. Having said that, the Aussies may be very more than satisfied with how things are going for them because they are rotating players, and we get word now that this young 21-year-old Jake Fraser McGurk, who has played two ODIs, exciting attacking batsmen, made debut in T20s tonight. So the Aussies seem to have their program on track as well. Yeah, they're honestly, I think they're such a good outfit. And you talk about bilateral series, but it's the tournaments where they really come alive. The key thing about them to remember is that this bowling attack is without Pat Cummins, without Mitchell Stark, who will certainly start in their T20 World Cup 11. Um, and they are able to have so much depth, but I think develop a culture of winning, which they want to win these bilateral series, even though they're resting guys. So I think probably teams, two teams at different stages, but the Australia side have just built a, a formula where you've got guys like Spencer Johnson coming in, playing a few matches, but I think they understand how much competition there is for places where you have to do well, even to have a, a, just a knock on the door. Whereas for the West Indies, this group of, of 14 or 15 guys is pretty much set going into that T20 World Cup, barring a few changes. So look, they're just culturally ahead. And I think they're a big tournament team. So watch out for them at this T20 World Cup because they're start as a favourite for sure. Yeah, Nikhil, I want you to go a little bit deeper into the West Indies bowling wars, especially with what has happened over the last um, 12 months or so in terms of... Uh, the scoring rate against them? Yeah, Ricardo, I think the biggest area of improvement, and I want to start by saying Darren Sami and the selection panel have got it right when it comes to the personnel. I believe this is the personnel to execute this. But you look at this graphic, um, the West Indies, in terms of uh, the last five overs, have conceded the third most in the world. And it's an area where it continues to sort of bite them. You saw in that last T20, they conceded 58 off the last three. That's the difference between 240 and maybe 210 if you if you concede 40 from the last three. So I think it's going to come down to Darren Sami getting his bowlers ready for that World Cup. The key thing is execution. As I said, Holder, Joseph, Shepard, etc. I believe they're the best men for the job. However, how can we mold this bowling lineup into a way where we can execute and find our best execution at the back end of the innings? Whether that be the wide Yorker, the straight Yorker, I just feel the execution has just been missing at critical times in that England series, in that Australia series that we're experiencing now. And I think that is the only thing that is separating South Africa, Australia, India, who for me, I think are top three favorites for that T20 World Cup and them. But home advantage is a big plus. I think that will certainly boost them. The death bowling, if they can get that right come four months time, I don't think there are many teams that can beat this West Indies side just because of that batting pedigree, but also the match winners that they have. Yeah, it's interesting because when I looked at that graphic, um, Nikhil, the thing that jumped out at me um, was the teams at the lower end of that graphic, meaning that they are doing best in the death bowling regard. Afghanistan and New Zealand, both of them are in the <laughs> same group as the West Indies for the T20 World Cup this summer. Yeah, and I would also say to guys, people will look at us and say, well, look, Australia is above the West Indies. Remember that. It's not really their strongest bowling lineup. They rotate a lot. Same with South Africa, who've only played six matches. New Zealand, however, have kept a, a pretty tight core with guys like Trent Bowl, uh, Mitch Santner, and, and their bowling lineup. And they've done really well away from home as well. So I think them will be a, a serious threat for the West Indies. And Afghanistan bowled a lot of spin in the last five. And we know we've had our wars against spin. You catch Afghanistan and Guyana or Trinidad, good luck. Honestly, good luck. Yeah. By the way, would you make any changes for the third T20 on Tuesday morning? Yeah. Uh, Ross and Chase, just kidding. <laughs> I, I would like to see Gurukesh Moti, uh, Gurukesh Moti come in for sure. I, I think he's quality. And let's get that mode of playing the two spinners together going into that World Cup. So I would, one change I would make is Moti in for Rutherford. Yeah, for some reason, I, I don't think you were really joking, but <laughs> I'm not going to take you on on that. Um, we're going to invite you to Kingston one of these days, um, Nikhil, for a cricket match. And let's see if you have the ability to turn the ball away um, from anybody. <laughs> OK, I look forward to that, man. I'm just a little scared of Kingston, but 
Other than that, I'll, I'll, once I have some security, I'll come down. <laughs> we'll ensure you're okay, young man. Don't worry. He'll be Thank perfectly you, fine. You. It's time to take a break <laughs> on the sports mic zone. I don't really know how else to respond to that. It's break time. Yeah. <laughs>